Very good to see everyone. It's lovely to um, be together this morning at St. Paul's. Um, if you're a visitor, you're very we welcome. Do try and stay behind for coffee afterwards. We'd love to get to know you. I'm Dan McGowan. I'm the vicar here. Um, and Steve, our curate, will be um, speaking to us a bit later on, on our 1 Samuel 15. But isn't it good to be together? We're going to be continuing in our series in 1 Samuel, uh, looking at the kingship and God's plan for his people. It's a good question to ask. How is Israel's kingship fulfilled perfectly in Jesus Christ and his kingship? Lovely. Well, we're going to um, pray and then we'll sing. Let's bow our heads. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have crowned him King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that he is our risen Savior. Father, thank you that it's because of Jesus that we're here this morning. And we pray that as we meet, you'll be teaching us from your word, growing our hearts in love for you, and sending us out to serve the King. <coughs> Father, please uh, fill our hearts, we pray. Uh, for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. So we have gathered because Jesus is King. We want to worship him as our maker, our defender, our redeemer, and our friend. So when the music starts, we're going to stand and sing, Oh, worship the King. Give him our worth. Wonderful. Do take a seat. Thy mercies, how tender, firm to the end. What a great saviour we have. Um, just one or two uh, church family news for you, um, for your prayers and for your information. It's our AGM or our annual church or annual parish church meeting coming up at the end of the month, 23rd. 
There's a note on the news sheet, so hopefully you've got a news sheet um, online, but if you need a hard copy, there's one at the back. Do take one home with you. But it's coming up, so there we'll be looking over the last year and then hopefully looking forward as well. We'll be electing our wardens and at both centres there's a sheet um, if you want to nominate someone and so on. So, um, and today is the last day for joining the electoral roll. Um, I'm not going to go on about that, but if you want to know what that is, it's how you become sort of an official legal member of the church and you can vote and so on and so forth. Um, do come and speak to me or Sue. Sue's going to wave her hand there, Sue. Thank you, Sue, um, about that. And PCC membership, um, if that's something that's on your heart, do come and chat to me or Steve at the end. But this is your final Sunday. And uh, then we're going to uh, close the ballot. Also, tonight is our 5 p.m. service. I, we do not always mention this in the morning, but we do meet at 5 o'clock at the Prescott Avenue Church Centre. You'll be very welcome to join us as we're going through Luke. And I'm going to invite Jeanette up now for a notice. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, now, I know it wasn't all that long ago that I stood up here, I think it was about two months, I stood up here asking for help with the egg hunt that we did around Princess Diana Park um, up on the Bretch Hill estate. As uh, I'm standing up here asking for help again um, because I just thought it would be a really good idea to keep going with the momentum. We had lots of families from the estate turn up, have lots of great fun. They've allowed me to keep their details. So I just, I just really wanted to do something in the summer term for the families to come along to. So we've got a, um, we've got a park event planned with a secret agent theme. Uh, that's going to be on Saturday the 18th of June. And we've already got lots of really exciting activities planned, but they do need people to run the different activities. Everything will be provided for you. They're really simple, but we do need people to help set up. We do need people to be there uh, during the event, running the activities, and obviously to clear up as well. And quite usually I just need a couple of gazebos, easy to put up gazebos, but we need quite a few if possible. So please do think, please do pray about whether you might be able to help with this. I'm, I'm really excited, I really want to do this event, but I cannot do this on my own. So please have a think, and over the next couple of weeks, uh, sign up on the list on the back if you feel that you could help, and then that will help me know whether it's, it's going to be viable and we can start advertising it amongst the families and amongst the schools up on the estate. Great, thank you. Uh, Tor's going to come and tell us a little bit about something coming up. Very exciting. Uh, this is the last time I'm going to do this one, but um, next Saturday is the Women's Day at Maidenhead. It's our area Women's Day. It's um, on Glorious Jesus first and last. That's, um, uh, there'll be two talks in the morning about Revelation and then seminars in the afternoon. There are 13 of us going together. If you'd like to come, please, would you let me know afterwards? You have until Friday to book on the Eventbrite site, but we're, we're putting together cars to go. So if you would like to come and you would like a lift, perhaps you can come and see me afterwards. It should be a great day. Great. I think that's um, enough from us. I'm going to hand over to Jeanette again. It's keeping me fit. Um, so hopefully you will remember from last week that in Sparklight, so that's our group on a Sunday mornings for children in primary school, we have started a new theme, a new teaching theme. So we are, going to, we are looking at Jesus' journeys. Now, has anyone seen a signpost that might help us with a clue as to the story today. Oh, Reuben has. Okay, Reuben, can you, can you see what it says? The wilderness. Great. Can you go to the wilderness then, please, Reuben? <laughs> oh, <laughs> running to the wilderness. I'm not sure the rest of us would run to the wilderness, but there you go. <laughs> Ooh, we're quite low on families this morning, aren't we, actually? 
Uh, Samuel, would you like to go and get something from the wilderness for me, please? I'm just trying to choose people I didn't you ask last time. And Nathaniel, could you possibly go to the wilderness and collect something, please? Thank you. Oh, I was just going to ask for a mummy or daddy to go. Thank you. So there's three different, there are three different things there. Yep, Samuel's got one. Mary's got one. Great. Okay, so carry them really carefully. Just walk, just walk, just walk, just walk. <laughs> Great. Okay. They're in, they're in there because they're quite pointy. Okay, so come up here. Next week, next time, I will try and remember where it's going. Okay, so big loud voice, Reuben, what have you got? I've got three stones. He's got some stones, some rocks. So let's just put these three together. So we've got the wilderness. Thank you. Can I do something like that? Lovely. Oh, Steve, thanks. I thought it was going to whistle at me if I did that. Okay, thanks. Okay, come nearer, come nearer, come nearer. Thank you. Okay, let's start again. Uh, so, first clue, the wilderness. Second clue? Four stones. Okay, we're not worried about the number, but well done for being accurate. Whoa! Oh, my goodness. We haven't done the first aid course yet. Did it land on your foot? Phew. It didn't land on his foot, Mummy. We're okay. Okay. Ribbon's holding those very tightly and very safely. <laughs> okay, so we've got some stones. We've got some rocks. We've also got... Reuben's temple? Yeah, not Reuben's temple. It's a temple that Reuben made. But we've, <laughs> we've, got, we've got the temple. Brilliant. Samuel, you'll have to come a bit nearer. I've got a, a globe. He's got a globe showing us the world. So, four clues as to the true Bible story we're looking at today. The wilderness, rocks, the temple, and the world, and everything in it. Put your hand up if you're smugly thinking, I know the story from the Bible. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, so spark like children, see those, okay? So, uh... Where if you see these, if you see the spark like children with their parents um, after the main service, then do go and see if you're correct. Thank you. Right, guys, I want you to hang on to those because you need to take them down to spark like for me, please. Great. Thank you very much. Off you go. That was amazing. Losing a stone in one minute. I thought that uh, usually we're. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm here all week, of course. Right. Um, where are we? Well, when I saw the globe, when I saw um, the stones, the temple, um, I was reminded that Jesus is king of all those things. And we're going to sing a song about that. So I'm going to invite the musicians up. And Jesus, amazingly, despite being king of kings and lord of lords, he wants us to come to him, uh, to enjoy him, not just for 10 minutes or an hour, but forever. So we're going to sing, will you come to Jesus and crown him as your king? That makes, please rule me, Jesus. Um, please be my king. Uh, today, as I go to Sunday group, um, as we listen to the sermon, or whatever we're doing in the next few minutes, we want to be saying, we want to crown you. So you ready? When the music starts, you've got to stand up and sing this.
Wonderful. Do take a seat. Um, I thought of something, Gina. Um, if you can't quite see the words at the front, um, we do have handouts of all the words that I think just on the font there, if you want to grab one. Um, in our next slide, you'll see what's going on now. We've got Crash down the side and in the hall, as well as Sparklight. Who's in Sparklight? Excellent. Oh, brilliant. Well, we're looking forward to Sparklight. Um, and Laser is tonight at 7 o'clock. And Patrick, you'll be praying for Laser, won't you? Um, tonight. So let's pray for all of them, and uh, then we'll go to our groups. Our loving God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your word, that you're a speaking God. Please teach us from your word now, as we go to our groups and as we stay in here in the main church. And for tonight, Lord, at Laser, we pray that you'll be growing us in love for you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you'd like to exit for your groups. And make sure you get your stones with you, the temple. You've got the world with you there, Nathaniel. You've got the whole world in your hands. No, he's dropped it. I know that's Patrick. Wonderful. Right, we're going to um, grab our Bibles and we're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'll hand over to Peter. By now you would have found on page 285 of the Church Bibles, 1 Samuel Chapter 15. Samuel said to Saul, I am one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came out of Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that they do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt, so the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up 
and went to meet Saul. But he was told, uh, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honour and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? And what is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them back from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, you do you did not become the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them till you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the son of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught the hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to one of your neighbours, to one better than you. He who is the king of glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it would be great if you could uh, keep that passage open in your Bibles in front of you. Let's pray, shall we, as we begin. Our gracious Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for all that it teaches us. And as we look at it this morning, Father, we pray, would you lead our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the Lord Jesus, that his name may be lifted high. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Well, I don't know uh, who you would consider to be uh, an inspirational leader, one who is of particular interest to you. If you've been around uh, the Church of England for any time recently, you'll know that there have been some problems arising, hasn't, haven't there, with inspirational leaders, people who, who have led great congregations and then something dreadful has happened. They've had a moral failure or they've turned out to be abusers in some way. 
they've turned out not to be the real deal, if you like. They're not what we expected. They've been a disappointment. And we naturally follow those inspirational leaders, don't we? Even though they're flawed. And that was something that Israel was discovering the hard way. It doesn't go well when we place our trust in human leaders who so often can be disappointing rather than the Lord God. And Saul learned, didn't he, that when God told him to do something, God meant it. Well, I'm going to unpack the passage for us this morning just under two headings. Firstly, the disappointing king, that's uh, from verses 1 to 11, and secondly, the rejected king, verses 12 through to the end. But before we get to that first section, I do just want to spend a few minutes dealing with what you might call the elephant in the room, or as a friend of mine used to call it, the dead moose on the dinner table. Um, and, and that's verse 3. Have a look at verse 3, would you? Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. That's a pretty tough verse, isn't it? And it's often been said to me, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but I don't like that brutal Old Testament God. And as we read that verse just on its own, it sounds like a war crime, doesn't it? It sounds utterly horrid. Actually, we shouldn't shy away from that. It is horrid. The commentator John Woodhouse says, there is no way to lessen the horror of this moment. But it does leave us asking sometimes, doesn't it, where does God, who is the very definition of perfect love, fit in to that instruction in that verse? Well, I just want to share some principles to help us as best as we can uh, to understand some things that the, the Bible teaches which are difficult. Now, firstly, the Bible records lots of pretty unsavory things. After all, it deals with sin and with evil, as well as God's glorious answer to it in the Lord Jesus. And we believe that the Bible is true, don't we? But it is not ever trying to be a sanitized account of history. It doesn't avoid the difficult things. In a sense, if I can steal that old slogan... It does what it says on the tin. It presents God's word and it doesn't sugarcoat the truth to make it sweeter. And of course, neither should we. <clears throat> Second principle, <clears throat> excuse me, God's view of love and the way we in society view love are fundamentally different. See, God's perfect love is expressed both in grace, poured out for us, and on the other hand, in judgment. You see, God has a settled hatred of evil. He will not, in fact, he cannot tolerate it. It would be contrary to his very nature to say, ah, oh, whatever, it's fine. And... I want us to see that that is actually really good news for those who place their trust in the Lord Jesus. It's good news because in verse 3, God's judgment is all about the protection of his people. Commentator Dale Ralph Davis put it like this, No vengeance on God's enemies means no deliverance for his people. In fact, Isaiah said in chapter 61 verse 2, that he was sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God. Why? To comfort all who mourn. Thirdly, it's good news because I'm sure you've had this experience. It's just natural within our beings 
to want to see justice done. We're made in God's image after all, so our nature in certain aspects reflects his nature, albeit dimly. I wonder whether you've ever come across those uh, items on the news where something terrible has happened and -and so-and-so has been sentenced to a whole life term and they interview uh, the family who've had perhaps a, a loved one murdered and so they've lost them. And they might say something like, well, that sentence won't bring our loved one back. But it does seem like justice has been served today. Other people sometimes, maybe you've said this, I think I've probably said this at times, you see a certain sentence given and you say, well, I hope they throw away the key. It's it's kind of verbalising the reality that to us as people, justice matters. Now, as Christians, when we face the wrath of God in his judgment, when we stand before him, we will do so knowing that our sin is paid for. We don't have to face it alone, but we rejoice in the certainty that in his death, Christ suffered that judgment for us. I found this uh, phrase from Tom Wright helpful. God's wrath is God's love as experienced by the unrepentant sinner. But for the repentant sinner, who turns away from sin and comes to the cross, then they are united with Christ. That's the joy of the gospel, isn't it? To be one with Christ throughout all eternity. And therefore, rather than writing off these tough judgments and saying, oh, that's just the Old Testament God, don't like that, but we love Jesus, we shouldn't be writing them off in that way. Those Difficult things expressed through the whole Bible, sometimes called God's divine retribution. We should praise him for that. Because it is always a just and a right judgment. I often refer to this verse in Genesis 18, verse 25, when I I, I just, I, I really struggle to describe something that's going on. And that verse says this, will not the judge of all the earth, do right? And of course the answer is yes. He is the judge of all the earth and he will do right. So with that little um, introductory explanation, what's the problem then with the Amalekites? Why did they need complete destruction? Well, to, uh, to just to understand the context of that, we need to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. I'll read it for you. If you want to follow, it's on page 203. But Deuteronomy 25, verse 17. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out. They met you on on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. That suggests or implies... Uh, the women, the children, the elderly, the less able. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. In effect, Amalek had committed war crimes against God's people. So God said they must be totally destroyed, utterly wiped out. And lest we think, by the way, but but what about second chances and what about the opportunity for them to repent? Well, in our chapter today, verses 18 and 32 to 33 show us that all these years later they are still unrepentant. They are still evil. They are still set against God. So, praising God for his just and right judgment on those who stand against him. Let's look briefly at how this passage helps us to look to Jesus, the perfect king, the undisappointing king, by considering the kingship of Saul, who, as our first point was, the disappointing king. 
Uh, you may recall how in chapter 8, when we, we preached uh, this, um, the previous section of 1 Samuel last year, the Lord graciously allowed Israel's request for a king, even though that said and implied that they were turning their back on God, the perfect king. But Israel so wanted a king. Despite all God had said to them through Samuel about what a human king would be like, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles for us. They didn't think God was enough for them. They wanted something different. And as a military tactician, Saul didn't do such a bad job, did he? He, he mustered an army. He set an ambush. He protected the innocent Kenites from harm. We can see that in verses 4 to 8. But Saul nevertheless didn't quite live up to expectations. He was a disappointing king. And why was he such a disappointing king? Well, notice the big but at the start of verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Saul didn't do all that God had told him to do, did he? With clear instructions from from the Lord, verse 1, to utterly destroy the Amalekites, verse 3, despite killing all the men, women and children, Saul decides to save the king, perhaps a kind of trophy of war, and keep the best animals, later making some lame excuse about sacrifices. Strange, isn't it? Saul seems to think that those best of the animals were of more importance than the men, the women, the children, the weaker people. That's why in verses 10 and verse 35, uh, even beyond the, the bit that was read today, the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. He had not obeyed everything that the Lord had instructed, just some of it. It's a bit like me saying, I've, I don't know what I've done, I've never killed anybody. And thinking, therefore, I'm all right. But actually, I've completely ignored God in every other respect. Saul had only done just some of what the Lord asked of him. And verse 11 gives us the reason for that grief, doesn't it? I'm grieved that I made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. I'm sure many of you here know people that you grew up with who loved the Lord Jesus, were fervent for the Lord Jesus, and now they've turned their back. They have no interest anymore. It's a tragedy, and it grieves the Lord. The instructions were clear, weren't they? Saul knew what he had to do, but something else, says Woodhouse, had captured his attention. It's worth just pondering briefly what, what, what it means that the Lord was grieved. Does it mean he'd made a mistake? Did he not foresee that as God of the whole universe and so be prepared for it? Or did he change his mind? Well, verse 29 that was read at the end of our passage passage tells us, doesn't it, that, that that cannot be the reason. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. But there's no contradiction here. God did regret, as the ESV puts it, making Saul king. It grieved his heart. I think what grieved his heart was Saul's disobedience. All that had happened is exactly what God said would happen in chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. If the king and the people do not obey the voice of the Lord. That was the message back then. 
God is not a, a you win some, you lose some kind of a God. Verse 11 doesn't show us God getting upset because he failed to spot something which later thwarted his plans. I'm sure you and I have all had that at some point in life. Something happens and you kind of face slap yourself and go, God, I should have seen that coming. No, it shows us here that God is grieved over Saul's sinful lack of obedience to him. God is not a cold slab of concrete devoid of any feeling. He notices when we turn away from him and disobey him. And sin grieves his heart. We're back into um, the, the flow of the story and we get to our second point, the rejected king, verses 12 onwards. Saul, notice, has gone off to build a monument in his own honour. That's interesting in itself, isn't it? Not in God's honour. And when Samuel finally tracks him down, we get the extraordinary, almost childish defence by Saul, don't we? Despite the, shout, the sound of the sheep bleating and the cows lowing, and the very alive prisoner, no doubt, somewhere tied up, King Agag, Saul says, I did everything God said. It was, it was my soldiers who brought all the sheep and the cattle back. Nobody likes a leader who passes the buck, the buck and blames everybody else, do they? I, I just had this picture of Saul at this point, a little bit like sometimes you see with children. You imagine their face is covered with chocolate. It's all over their hands. I didn't do it. He ate it. All the evidence is somewhere else, but that, oh, I've been caught. I need to pass the buck. It doesn't go well when you are a leader. So Samuel asks Saul very bluntly, doesn't he, in verse 19, why did you not obey the Lord? And Saul still maintains his innocence. The chocolate is still all over his face. He's still pretending it wasn't him. Which brings Samuel to the heart of what Saul needs to learn in verses 22. And 23. Have a look at those with me. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. It's powerful, isn't it? You see, what does God really want, Saul? He doesn't want your grudging, partial, mealy-mouthed obedience to just the bits that you want to obey in. He doesn't want your sacrifices. No. He wants your obedience to his word. Just note in passing, by the way, how David, who appears on the scene in the following chapters from next week onwards, is a very different king. Uh, he wrote in Psalm, 46, uh, Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, these words. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced, Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. It's quite a contrast, isn't it, to this king who is coming. You see, Saul had none of that desire to do God's will. Only, it seems, to do what seemed best to him. Just as an aside, by the way, that is the deceitfulness of sin, isn't it? It tricks us into thinking, oh, it doesn't really matter. It'll be okay. I'll just ask God to forgive me again. But I'll keep my fingers crossed while I do it. 
You see, Samuel again summarizes the problem in verses 24 to 28, and Saul makes a play of seeking forgiveness. But Samuel reminds him, the Lord has rejected you as king. And so in his desperation, Samuel, as, as Samuel is walking off, Saul grabs him, no, wait, 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 grabs hold of his gown, his robe, and it tears. And that gives Samuel the perfect illustration of God, what God will do. You've torn my robe. God is going to tear you away from being the king in his kingdom. And he's going to hand the kingdom over, as he says, to one better than you. Um, spoiler alert, that's going to be King David, just in case you can't make it next week. We can see that's referenced in chapter 28, 17, if you want to check that through. And Saul makes yet another go at showing repentance after that, but it's all skin deep. It's not heartfelt just have a look at me at verse 30, would you, which is just after where we finished reading earlier on. Chapter 15, verse 30. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honour me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. But do you notice his speech is about honouring me? And he doesn't, require, he doesn't equate God with his God, no, I, so that I may worship your God. You see how Saul is distant from God. And the tragic, the, 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 kind of the tragedy of the story of, of, of the disappointment and rejected king ends with the prophet Samuel doing the king's job and finally executing King Agag, finishing off finally the Amalekites. It's a strange dynamic, isn't it? The warrior king having his job done by God's prophet. No wonder we end this sad series of events with a reminder that the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Well, it's a, a disappointing king who becomes a rejected king but perhaps has much to teach us. So just in closing, what are we to learn from all of this? Well, firstly, uh, there may be somebody here or with us or on the live stream who wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian or you're just not sure or maybe you're here just thinking, I want to check these things out. I haven't really bottomed it all out yet. Um, if that's you, can I say it's great that you're here and that you're checking out what the Christian faith is all about. Keep thinking, keep exploring, and keep listening to the teaching of this passage. Because we too are called to obey God and to submit to him. But it's worth us thinking briefly about what that means. You see, it doesn't mean doing loads of stuff like Saul did. You know, he was trying to bring sacrifices in our case, we can be tempted sometimes to think, oh, I must obey God. I've got to do loads of stuff. I want to please him. I'm going to do lots of good deeds. I'm going to do charitable work. I'm going to donate to whatever it is. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to serve on my town council. I'm going to do coffee after church. I'm going to cut the grass at church. I'm going to help give to the poor. Now, of course, these are all good things to do, but they can never, can they, make us right with God. We could never do enough to make ourselves right with God. Instead, first and foremost, obeying God means submitting yourself to Jesus Christ. The one who has been obedient, if you like. He's done all the obedience that's needed on our behalf in going to the cross. So your obedience to him means benefiting from his obedience and relying on his grace and not your own. As Saul discovered, not obeying God is foolishness in the extreme, isn't it? He was rejected. And if we continually, in this day and age, reject coming to the Lord Jesus as our saviour, if we refuse to repent and come to him, 
we will face that rejection too one day when God judges all the earth. So can I encourage you, if you're not yet sure about all these things, please don't reject the offer of Jesus. Come to him at the cross. The consequences of rejecting him are eternal. Let me invite you, if you haven't already, to trust in the Lord Jesus. Submit to him. And if you'd like help with that, if you're not quite sure still, you've got questions, that's fine. Do come and have a chat to me afterwards or chat to Dan afterwards. We'd love to talk more with you. And secondly, for those of us here this morning who are Christians, what does it teach us? Well, it's good to remember, isn't it, that Saul showed, made a show of obedience. He did some of what God said, but then justified himself with feeble excuses and blaming others for the bits of his disobedience. So what does obedience look like? Well, as we've already said, it's not about activity. It's not about us bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices. He wants us to listen to him and obey him in all things. In other words, he wants our hearts. He doesn't want our mealy-mouthed second best. So don't fall for the deceitfulness of sin. That kind of niggling away, that little, little word in your head that says, don't worry, God won't mind if I, whatever it is, fiddle my expenses, it'll be okay. He won't mind if I go along with that foul mouth gossip behind someone's back at school. Or perhaps for you guys in laser, he won't mind if I cheat a bit at my exam, it'll be good to get ahead a little bit. He won't mind if I look at pornography. It's not really doing any harm, is it? It is, by the way. Jesus won't really mind if I get drunk with my mates or if I do drugs or if I sleep with somebody I'm not married to. You get the picture. There's a whole range of other things. You'll know the ones that apply to you. Don't let the devil suck you into the idea that God is not bothered about sin. It grieves his heart. And anything else that says that sin is okay is a lie. Instead, let us humbly acknowledge that sometimes, like Saul, we have been superficial in our obedience to him and perhaps tried to cover it up and put on a good show. Well, we have a, a perfect opportunity in a few minutes as we come to the Lord's table, don't we? to bring our confession to him of those times when we've put him as second to other things or possibly third or fourth or whatever. We come to the table, to the Lord's Supper here, joyfully but humbly with open hands and open hearts to receive from the Lord Jesus the blessings that he abundantly pours into our hearts through his spirit. And I pray that as he as we gather around his table, that that will give us the strength to trust him in all things, feeding on him in our hearts by faith and with great thanksgiving. Amen. Uh, we're going to pray now. Heavenly Father, we are so often like Saul, disregarding your word when it suits us. We can be so fearful of what others will say or do that we fail to stand up for the truth and turn instead towards sinful, disobedient behaviors. We pretend our behavior is okay, blame others, or we try to justify our actions. Thank you, Lord, that even when we are tempted in these ways, you have promised to forgive us if we are trusting in the death of your only son, Jesus, who took on the punishment we deserve for each and every time that we turn away from you to satisfy our own desires. And so I pray that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, being rooted and established in love, so that we will have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and the mercy of his Father. Lord, 
In your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our church family, a body of people that supports and builds one another up to the glory of Christ. Thank you for the people that invite others for coffee or for lunch, for the many volunteers that ensure we have music and many, many events, as well as ensuring that we are safe and cared for. Thank you for the people that look out for newcomers, welcoming them and making sure that they are looked after, or the people that pray for one another or make an effort to speak to somebody new. Thank you, Lord, that we are a church family that looks like a family. Heavenly Father, thank you for our amazing staff team who are faithful to the gospel, working tirelessly for the sake of the gospel and faithful to that gospel. We ask for your protection over them and over their families. We pray that they would continue to serve you to the glory of your name. Lord, we thank you too for those who lead us in many ways, whether through the PCC or as a Bible study leader. Again, we ask that you would keep them faithful to the truth of your word as they serve their brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we pray for Alex Keane as he finishes up some final exams in preparation for his ordination. We pray especially for Alex and his family as they prepare to move to Tamworth at the end of the month in order for Alex to serve at the Peel group of churches there. We pray that the girls would make great new friends that will help them to feel welcome and well settled. We pray too that all of the practicalities of moving would go smoothly including school applications for them. And above all, we pray that Alex would be a blessing in his new church, standing firm for the sake of the gospel. Um, I'm going to use the words of Psalm, 50, uh, sorry, Psalm 55 to pray for Ukraine. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying. Because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. Lord, confuse the wicked, confound their words, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I would endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about amongst the worshippers. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead. For evil finds lodging among them. As for me, I call to the Lord, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me. Even though many oppose me, God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them because they have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay the bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. Merciful Father, 
Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, we'll now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Praise God. Um, we're going to sing uh, again. Um, Saul was a disappointing king. Jesus was, is our perfect, our perfectly obedient king. And he deserves our immortal honors, to honor him eternally. And as sinners, the best thing we can do is that, that our souls, our love would praise him more. So we're going to sing this wonderful song of victory, of giving our hearts to him. Starts. Do please stand. wonderful, isn't it? As sinners, the best we can do is to go to Jesus and rest in him. Well, we'll remain standing and we're going to join in our statement of faith, the creed, um, to encourage one another and to pledge ourselves again to Jesus. So together, we believe in God the Father from whom grace and peace proceed. 
whom we serve with our whole heart. We believe in Jesus Christ as to his humanity, born a descendant of David. We believe in the Holy Spirit, by whose power Jesus was declared to be the Son of God through his resurrection from the dead. We believe in Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So be it. Do take a seat. Um, it's time to go and... I think the children now come to us, uh, but it's time for the groups uh, to come back to us. And as they are, why don't we, just before we join in our confession, we're going to just uh, chat to one another, perhaps something you've picked up from the sermon. Um, but a couple of, mo- couple of minutes of chat, and then I'll bring you back to order in a moment. Going to my own, yeah, brilliant. I think we're going to uh, draw our conversations to a close, and we're going to come to a time of confession. The Bible says, if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we admit our sins and say sorry to God for them, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. He's so good to us. So we do come to this confession with with joy because we can bring our sins before him knowing that he loves us and forgives us in Christ. So we're going to say this prayer together, perhaps reflecting on what we've been hearing this morning about disobedience, about 
being distracted by other things, we can bring our lives back to him as we confess. So together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, from which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may hit serve and please you in newness of life to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are those who grieve over their sin. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. So Lord, because of Jesus, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And bring us, as you've promised, because of the cross, unto everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen we find further assurance of forgiveness in these words of comfort. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Praise him. Well, all are welcome at the Lord's table. Um, if you're in a right relationship with the Lord Jesus, um, if you're unsure, uh, just come up and keep your hands by your side. We'd love to pray for you. And uh, do tell us if you want a non-alcoholic uh, and if gluten-free is, and you might need to remind me as we come round. Um, there'll be a glass per household as usual, and um, the steward will come and fill enough wine for whether it's one person in the household or more. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift your heart, our hearts to the Lord. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night that he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. On, at the end of the supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. 
as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us again, that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and the blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you a sacrifice of praise, lifting our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. We pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
prayer after the communion. We pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for reassuring us at this communion of your favor and goodness towards us, that we are truly members of the body of your Son, and that we are also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom. We humbly beg you, Heavenly Father, to keep us as faithful members of your church and to strengthen us by your Spirit so that we may fulfill those good works which you have prepared for us to do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus is the Word of God the Father from before the world began by his voice. Every star, every planet came into existence. His words hold all creation together. And with his word, he calls us and sends us. So as the music starts, let's stand and sing. You are the word of God the Father. Super duper. Do take a seat. Jesus is the Word, and by His Word, all creation is held together. And we will mess up, won't we? We will do us all. We will be disobedient, even this week. We will mess up, but we can come to Jesus who has obeyed on our behalf perfectly and rest in Him. We praise Him for that. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for what we've been learning in our groups. We thank you for what we've been learning in here about Jesus as our true King. And we pray, Lord, as we go into this new week, that we'll be able to uh, crown him as King, uh, submit to his kingship joyfully, 
uh, bringing our hearts before him. Lord, use us, we pray, to the glory of your name. Send us in Jesus. And we pray it all for his glory. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Do join us for coffee, uh, a tea, a selection of biscuits. Um, do rejoice, there's a heater ready to be installed this week. And do congratulate Yvonne Shadbolt, who's 90. He's just turned 90, and I've just spotted she's with us. Um, we'll give her the bumps after coffee. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. <laughs>